are these people? I figured we should talk about some monetary financial things related to the Palestine conflict. So we're we're gonna get into that. So I found this. Uh, I think it was through Shearpost. Um, yes. So, which I haven't heard of Jason Hickel. I'm sure people will inform me of who this person is. Um, you know, he had a whole list of acolytes. Um, but he writes why liberated Palestine threatens global capitalism. So, this is an excerpt, right? And uh, from a clip, which I'll I'll pull some of the clip here in a second. But um, luckily, there's a transcript, nice and easy for us. So, a liberated Palestine means a liberated Middle East. A liberated Middle East means capitalism in the core really faces a crisis, and they will not let that happen. It's funny. Like, I'm always asked to talk about ecology when really what I want to talk about is capitalist imperialism, and the two are just a piece of the same problem, right? The ecological crisis is ultimately paying out along colonial lines, right? We know that this is the countries of the imperial core that are overwhelmingly overwhelmingly responsible, and specifically the ruling classes who control the means of production and energy systems and investment, etc., cetera, et cetera are overwhelmingly responsible for the excess emissions that are driving climate breakdown. We know that's a fact. We also know it's a fact that the global south suffers the overwhelming majority of the impacts of climate breakdown. So, oh, too many. Um, the people who have contributed literally nothing to the crisis whatsoever, not contributed a small amount, contributed nothing, right? And it's not just, of course, climate breakdown that we face. There's also other dimensions of the ecological crisis, and here too, we see the same thing playing out. When it comes to excess material use in the world economy, overwhelmingly, it's due to excess material use and accumulation in the imperial core. Half of the material that's used in the core is net appropriated by the periphery from the territories of the global south, which causes severe damage. You don't see this damage in Sussex or in Finland. You see it in the Congo. You see it in Indonesia. You see it in Bolivia and the frontiers of extraction, the core benefits and everyone else suffers. Any questions so far, Gerber? I feel like no. we're right on it. Okay. So self-explanatory. Yep. Um, which we'll let him explain a bit further. And bit. The ecological crisis represents processes of colonization and appropriation, and also is a disaster that's playing out along colonial lines. I think that's really important to spell out. And if we're not attentive to those colonial dimensions, I, I really think we're fundamentally missing the point. We're fundamentally missing the point. The other thing I want to point out here is that, we, is that we, we're in this incredible paradox, right, where the world economy, we know, is just massively productive. Like, our productive capacities are incredible. Think of the scale of the labor that humanity has at its disposal, the resources, the technology, uh, the factories, the energy, the materials. Incredible amounts of production to the point of breaking past ecological limits. And yet, the vast majority of the human population lives in conditions of massive deprivation. 80% of the mm -hmm. population can't meet basic needs. So what explains this incredible paradox? It's ultimately our system of production. The social and ecological crisis that we face which appears unresolvable, is ultimately a symptom of our, of, our, of our system of production, capitalism, where our productive capacities, our incredible productive capitalism. capacities, are organized overwhelmingly around what is most profitable to capital and what can most facilitate accumulation in the core, rather than what is obviously necessary to meet human needs and achieve our ecological objectives. And so we're in this wild place where it's like, oh, solving poverty is just going to take generations. Right? If we're lucky, we'll get people above $1.90 a day by the end of the century. Right? The climate crisis, who can figure out how to, how to solve this? It seems intractable. None of this is true. It's lies. Uh, these are problems that can be very easily solved and very quickly. Where's, where's he wrong so far? You know? He's not. Uh, pause. Okay. Cool. It, it, um, it, it, it's just funny how it just reminded me of it's funny how Kamala can talk about or at least her campaign is talking about joy. When right. At least 60 percent of the of our population in, the, in this country are living paycheck to paycheck. And again, going back to 
the segment that we just played previously to this, you know, um, we talked about that young woman and her child basically being like, I'm homeless. I need money. I need food. I need shelter. Uh, I need care for my kid and for myself. Like that, she didn't sound like joyous to me. Yeah. Like, so it's the reality that more than half the people in this country are not experiencing any sort of joy whatsoever. And the gall of this woman to kind of think in her bubble, like, oh, but I find joy, you know, I live in a sheltered uh, mansion uh, off of Embassy Row in D.C. I get whatever I need, you know, in terms of I can go to all of these cool events and all this kind of stuff and hobnob with celebrities and all this kind of bullshit. And I have joy and you should have joy, too. And it's kind of like. No, like the reality is most of the world is not experiencing or feeling the joy that you claim that we should have if we vote. And that's the thing that just drives me nuts. Well, the problem is, Care Bear, we don't have control of our of our own productive capacities because we don't have an economic democracy, right? Some of us live in political democracies where from time to time we get to elect government officials But when it comes to the economic system, not even the pretense of democracy is allowed to exist. And that is ultimately the contradiction we face. I think this is a crisis that at its root is about capitalism and can only be resolved by overcoming that fact. And the antidote to capitalism is economic democracy, that we should have collective democratic control over what we are producing, what the goals of our production are, who benefits for our production, and so on. And when we do, we can solve these problems quickly because we know what to do. So we'll let him, oh, come on. There we go. Uh, bip. And bip. Cool. All right. We know exactly what to do. The problem is we don't have the power. And so I think that in the face of this crisis, we have to have clarity about what has to be achieved, and we have to start building the movements that are capable of achieving that. For the South, there's another element I think we have to pay attention to, which is that they need economic sovereignty, right? They need economic liberation at a national level first. The Global North is is overwhelmingly responsible for the crisis, but the Global South, we know, also needs to engage in ecological planning, energy transition, et cetera, et cetera. How does anyone expect them to do that when they do not have sovereign control over their own resources, their own labor, their own lands, their own energy, right? under the thumb of structural adjustment programs that prevent them from using progressive industrial policy, prevent them from using progressive fiscal policy, prevent them from using progressive monetary policy, basic tools that we know can allow them to achieve developments and ecological transition, they are effectively denied from using. Any questions? No. Well, I mean, I do find it interesting that, you know, we've said this before, you know, you, you brought on Dr. Africana, where it's like, we, we got to stabilize the global South, you know, mm-hmm. before they have the power to do the things they need to, you know? Right. So, but what is the solution to that for the South is struggles for economic liberation. Now I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that a struggle for economic liberation in the South is fundamentally antithetical to the capitalist world economy because accumulation in the core depends utterly on the cheapening of labor and resources in the global south. It depends utterly on that and has for the past 500 years. And so any attempt by liberation struggles in the periphery to achieve economic independence, to use their own resources for their own development, for their own ecological transition, for their own human needs, is destabilizing for capital in the core, and capital reacts with the most extraordinary violent backlashes. We see it happening all the time. Now it's Palestine, before it was Libya, before that Iraq, before that Chile, before that Indonesia, before that the Congo. It will never stop. It's over and over again. So 
any questions before I, I, I move on? I think I think you're on it. No. So, yeah, I think the West is worried. You know, so we'll we'll see why in a second. But here's <laughs> El, El Donald Trump says he will impose 100 percent tariffs on countries that abandon the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. That's all your BRICS countries, right? Brazil, Russia, China, yeah. you know, so we'll hear him. If a country tells me, uh, sir, we like you very much, but we're going to no longer adhere to being in the reserve currency. Uh, we're not going to uh, salute the dollar anymore. I'll say that's OK. And uh, you're going to pay a 100 percent tariff on everything you sell into the United States. And we love your product. I hope you sell a lot of it into the United States, but you're going to pay 100 percent tariff. Uh, he will then follow it up by saying, sir, it would be an honor to stay with the reserve currency. I will be that will be like just playing. That's not even chess. That's checkers. But you don't have other. Listen to this. You don't even, you don't have other people that can talk that way. Well, how do you think that's going to work out? Not good because <laughs> we've been seeing a lot of those tariffs affect us negatively so good luck with that you know but yeah um well we're gonna let jason finish up here i think so okay. this segment was short anyway but um here we go and i think the situation in Palestine right now, we have to understand, is not primarily a moral one. It's the, that's how we think of it. That is not how capital thinks of it. For them, it is a matter of, su of suppressing and crushing liberation movements, because a liberated Palestine means a liberated Middle East. A liberated Middle East means ca capitalism in the core really faces a crisis, and they will not let that happen. And they're unleashing the full violence of their extraordinary power to ensure it doesn't. And so I think that's really what we face, right? It's, it's the world system dimension of the, of the violence that we're seeing. And we have to be cognizant of that, and our struggles and our, and our resistance have to be in proportion. So that's why I wanted to bring that, just as far as, like, you know, me, me and have talked about what they want to do with Gaza after they ethnically cleanse it. Right, build mm -hmm. electric vehicle factories and 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 you know all to benefit Western power pretty much. So right. you know, as much as this is, is a moral thing and is religiously persecuted genocide, it's also economically connected. So follow the money. You'll you'll see a lot of the same players. You know, you'll see, you'll see Dick Cheney is getting the first oil deal in the Golan Heights. Funny how that works. <laughs> you, know, you know, you'll see that shit. So please do keep an eye on the economics of all this, as well as the moral justifications. But closing thoughts? I mean... I mean, we've talked about this all the time, but the you know, Af like the global south is the core, as he said, is the core of the resources of the world, and we have to protect it. But we shouldn't, and that's why you know. And I think we've mentioned this. I know Savvy has mentioned this, you know, on her show. You know, the idea of like uh, thinking of um, social democracy, you know, is flawed because in order for us to get you know, even in the best, like, we talk about, like, the Scandinavian countries as the standard of, you know, especially Bernie, you know, like, that idea of living here. But yeah. that still deals with the idea of exploiting people elsewhere. So, you know, so what's the true liberation tactic that all of us can be liberated and not necessarily depend or exploit others in order for us to have our liberation. So right. we've been talking about in regards to the Palestinians and like our rights here. And that's why, again, like foreign policy is local policy, uh, domestic policy, sorry. 
because we can't think about our own rights. And, and, and if we say, you know, we in this country we value the right of freedom, uh, freedom and the pursuit of happiness uh, to, and the right to life, yeah, we should ideally want the same rights for everybody, regardless mm -hmm. if they live in this country or not. So what are we doing to ensure that people around the world ideally have the same rights as we do? And not, again, not to, to exploit exploitation, but to ensure that they are truly liberated in whatever that means for those countries. So, yeah. yeah, I think just food for thought, I think, as we close out. But, for sure. Yeah. Speaking of economic, economic freedom, uh, scan the QR code. Go to codashfeed.com slash Indie News Network. Let us be a little bit more financially independent. Always appreciated. Donations are always welcome and appreciated. But if you can't give monetarily, you can always just like and subscribe. Hit the share button. You know, we're only word of mouth is about all we got right now. So share this with your friends. Leave a comment. You know, let us let us get some more people in the in in the club. So, you know, make that number go up. Otherwise, thanks for watching.